Hello, this is Matthias Gertz with my monthly COVID update. Trying to share my screen here, it is. Um, welcome, uh, 1st of June, uh, year three after Homo sapiens. Um, no light at the end of this particular tunnel and you remember this is a tunnel in Shanghai, um, but this headline refers to China as a whole, not necessarily Shanghai. I think in Shanghai, the local authorities are trying to find some way to pretend that they have a zero COVID policy and yet also pretend that they have a life, <laughs> which is a lot of pretending. <laughs> But that's probably better than most of China, where they're not even pretending that they have a life. <clears throat> uh, so, uh, so th this will take China uh, many years to come. So, uh, I mean, the good news is the so-called Asian century has already ended. <laughs> 1.4 uh, billion uh, ants in China are no danger to the rest of mankind. So that's the good news. Um, the bad news is these 1.4 billion ants could have been human beings, uh, but they're not permitted uh, to be human beings. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, and that's a big chunk of mankind, but of course, uh, all of mankind has been reduced to uh, some kind of cattle. So, uh, not only the Chinese, the Chinese are just particularly thorough at uh, reducing themselves to, to some kind of primitive animal uh, that just walks walks around the earth <laughs> mindlessly. So here we are, welcome to the mind, mindless world. And let me start with, oh, something about race. Yeah, and that's just because there's my next few slides are on a, a you know, interesting, uh, an interesting case that has something to do with, with race, I suppose. I don't even really know what races are supposed to be, to be honest. They don't exist biologically. Uh, it's just a mind mind thing, a mind game, you know, racial races. But uh, already 100 years ago, H.G. Wells, remember the author of The, the, the Time Machine and uh, The War of the Worlds and some other um, science fiction books, um, popular and famous science fiction books. He also wrote a uh, a history, a sort of a world history that was quite highly uh, regarded, I think, at that time. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing he, he said is from the point of view of the biologist, there is no such thing as a clearly distinct race because they are all mixed to, up here. Right? <laughs> we, are, we are migrants, we, we inter uh, marry, etc. So, uh, you know, there are a thousand shades of gray and no black and no white, right? Um, and even, you know, in so far as you want to categorize people by race at all, it, it's actually not doable, right? And uh, not that I would even want to do that myself, but some people apparently are very, very uh, eager. Uh, today I saw in the news that some Korean boy band uh, was received by the US president to talk about hate crimes against Asian Americans, right? So you, people just can't let go of uh, race, right? They, 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 they must every, stamp everything that happens with a race, racial label, right? And where it is not race, it is ethnicity or nationality or some, some kind of categorization that has nothing to do with the individual. Right? The individual is just the individual, right? And these are all labels that are imposed on them. Sometimes they, of course, self-impose. Some people, you know, say, I'm, I'm this and this race. Yeah, I mean, they have a right to do that um, if they do that themselves, but then they don't, shouldn't be too, too, too surprised that, you know, then other people then use those labels as well, right? So, <clears throat> Point being, there is no such thing as race. There's also no such thing as ethnicity. It, I know it's used widely in anthropology and in uh, you know, social studies and so on, but actually it, it, it's, it's a myth, right? There's no such thing as a clear ethnicity, right? Um, 
there just simply isn't because nobody can trace their ancestors that far back and where they came from. Maybe we all came out of Africa, right? So we're actually all African. <laughs> we are Homo sapiens sapiens, at least until three years ago we were, and that's it, right? <laughs> we're all Homo sapiens sapiens. Uh, doesn't really matter which part of the world we happen to be born. We didn't even choose where we are born, right? It's just a coincidence. So it's, it's meaningless, right? But of course, our whole system imposes, uh, you know, some silly meaning on these things, such as which location you were born in, right? Or what nationality your parents had. <laughs> Boom, your parents are German, so you must be German. <laughs> Uh, it's pure coincidence and has no meaning <laughs> but the meaning is then retroactively imposed by oh then you have a German passport so you are allowed to enter this and this country without a visa but this and this other country you need a visa because you're German <laughs> excuse me I'm a human being <laughs> No, <laughs> no, 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 it's not that easy. No, 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 you're not just some human being. No, 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 you're a German human being. <laughs> and that's different from an Italian human being in some ways that I can't fathom. <clears throat> yeah, so um, so let's talk about uh, race or ethnicity or whatever this topic actually is um, that came up. So this was at the very beginning of the month of May. <clears throat> so I already kind of forgot what it was because I then researched it right away. But so the, the Russian um, foreign minister uh, said some, oh, so he, in, in reference, um, okay, here's the background. So um, the Russians claimed that they were invading the Ukraine, among other things, to denazify them, right? <laughs> Whatever that's supposed to have meant, right? And then some reporter asked uh, Mr. Lavrov, uh, I think in Italy, um, Mr. Lavrov, you said you want to denazify, uh, you know, the, the Ukraine, especially the, the leadership. But are you aware that their president is actually Jewish? And I don't know whether Mr. Zelensky considers himself Jewish, and I don't even know what that means. That's the whole point. I don't know what it means to be Jewish. And I, I suspect if you ask 10 people who, tell, uh, who co consider themselves Jews, they will give you 10 different answers <laughs> why they consider themselves Jews. But okay, there are some people probably who think of themselves as Jews, but, what, but there's no... Um, there's no clear definition of what that means. And as I just said, some people say it's an ethno-religious group, yeah, but there's no such thing as an ethnic group in my view. It's just a, that's an illusion, right? And even in terms of the religion, there is no such thing as a, you know, a single, you know, religion that is called Jewish. There are many, many groups uh, that have quite diverse views and ultimately it all comes down to the individual, right? Uh, <clears throat> You know what what they believe in, and that cannot be that cannot be uh, bound and, and, and defined by putting them into a box. So, for example, I'm I'm a, a baptized and confirmed Lutheran Protestant Christian on paper. <laughs> so, if you went to the files, the archives in Germany, because I registered for being baptized and being confirmed, and I never um, actively left the church. You can you can actually do that, right? You can send them a letter and say, "I want to uh, exit the, the church." Yeah, uh, but I never did that. So I'm still in the ar archive as a Lutheran um, Protestant Christian, <laughs> but I don't believe in any of. The <laughs> in any of the uh, credos of that faith or any other faith. I'm completely without religion, actually. <laughs> and you ask me, as an in, if you actually ask me, what do I feel, actually, or how do, what is my belief? My belief is there is no such thing <laughs> as religion or God. I mean, yes, I mean, uh, empirically, there are people who think of themselves as religious, that I understand, right? But whatever they are believing in is not something that is based in any kind of reality, right? It's a, 
they believe in some version of some illusions and that's fine that everybody can do that it's not illegal to do that or anything and i don't mind but I myself, I don't believe any of that, right? But if you go into the archive, you will find me as a good Christian, <laughs> fully confirmed and baptized. So, yeah, so the statistics, I'm probably, uh, if I have statistics, right? Global population by religion. <laughs> I'm in the, presumably I'm in the Protestant statistics, yeah. Uh, there's no statistic for thinking people, obviously. <laughs> Who can think for themselves? So I'm, I'm one of those people who actually don't really fit into any category, I guess, because the answer is always going to be when you ask me, "What do I believe?" Then I always, the answer will always have to be, "Well, it depends, right? What do you mean by that, right?" Um, anyway, so um, that's me. But um, so, so the question by the reporter to Mr. Lankov was, "Well, are you aware that Mr. Zelinsky is considered or thinks of himself or whatever as a Jew?" And apparently Lavrov, on the spot, I guess, he was a court on the spot, right? He said, oh, that, is, that, that, that is, doesn't exclude him also be a Nazi, right? And then he said, wasn't Hitler actually also a Jew? <laughs> well, he, the way he put it is, I could be wrong, but Hitler also had Jewish blood. <laughs> Whatever that's supposed to be, Jewish blood. <laughs> Do they have more red or white, uh, you know, uh, blood particles? <laughs> All of you, the Jews, <laughs> Jewish blood. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, Mr. Lavrov, the foreign minister of Russia, <laughs> thinks there's such a thing as Jewish blood. <laughs> well, great. But anyways, apparently, uh, the you know the, the people around him. Some people around him knew what he meant. I, I don't know what he means, actually, but Jewish blood, I think he means. Yeah, well, I mean, he could have said Jewish genes, but that wouldn't be any better either. There's no such thing as Jewish genes either, right? So I think what he means is, doesn't he um, derive from some kind of a you know family background where maybe his parents or one of his parents or his grandparents were considering themselves to be Jewish or something like that, right? So I think he's he's referring to sort of their descent, right? I mean, we, this 21st century, right? As if your descent mattered in any way. <laughs> As if you're responsible for who you're descending from, right? Uh, which, of course, you, are, you didn't choose, right? But anyway, so this is a foreign minister. I mean, this is a politician, right? So I'm completely brainless. But here you go. So and then the other, so the other side, to speak, um, in, in, in Israel, the, you know, Israel is this kind of uh, regime that somehow believes that, is, uh, that its uh, uh, function in life is to uh, censor anybody who says anything about Jews. Right? That, I think that's why this organization exists. It's called State of Israel. Right? It's a censor. Uh, well, it's a kind of a terror organization actively in, in the, the terrorizing the Palestinians every day, etc. But it's also a, sen a censor. That's really their role. The, 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 the main role in life is to censor anybody who says anything about Jews. <laughs> So immediately, in like no time, the Israeli, I don't know, uh, here, the prime minister of Israel, yeah, mm -hmm. his name is whatever, Bennett, Naftali Bennett, um, such lies are meant to blame the Jews themselves for the most terrible crimes in history. <laughs> And just free the oppressors of the Jews from their responsibility. <laughs> well, first of all, you know, the biggest crime in uh, history is probably that of the Israelis against the Palestinians, right? But one can argue that, right? Which is the biggest crime in history. And two, no, I don't think Mr. Lavrov had anything like that in mind. He was just simply saying, basically, well, being a Jew as a religion, if you like, or a value system, or even, even if it wasn't an ethnography, which I don't think Lavrov meant, but I may be wrong there as well. Um, you know, it's, I mean, he talks about bloodline, so yeah, maybe he did, right? Um, but, you know, it's not mutually exclusive at all to be a Jew and a Nazi, right? 
In fact, the entire uh, so-called Zionist or Zionist movement among the Jews today, I mean, in the last hundred years, is quasi-Nazi, right? I mean, if, if you look at their ideology, it's, it's almost uh, impossible to uh, distinguish the ideology from the Nazi ideology. It's the same kind of racial superiority and uh, 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 right to land that is sort of God-given or given by history or, you know, it's the same ideas. That's why Hitler, you know, loved the Zionists and tried to collaborate with them <laughs> because it was so compatible. You know, they had the same types of beliefs as him, and they wanted a different geography. The Zionists, want, Zionists in the 19th century and early 20th century wanted to recreate a, you know, Israeli kind of state in Palestine, which they eventually got, right? <clears throat> and Hitler was, oh, yeah, please, please, because then I can send all my Jews from, you know, the areas in Europe that I want to occupy. I can send them all down there, right? Because he had no... Uh, he had no interest in that land, Palestine, you know, it was under British uh, rule at that time, and he, he had no problem with that. He, he would have loved the British to just continue running it, and if they would have said we establish a Jewish state here and all the European Jews, they were welcome to come down, he would have said, yes, please take them all. <laughs> right? So the, and the Zionists were actively promoting that state, right? Uh, so, so Zionists and Nazis got along in, in a way very, very well, right? Because they shared basically the same ideology for two different, uh, what they call races or peoples, but in different locations. So there was no conflict, right? If they had claimed the same location, that would have been very different. But since the Zionists claimed a very different location that Hitler and the Nazis had no interest in, it was perfectly compatible, right? And they, they realized that in Hitler or his people, apparently had uh, discussions with Zionists to collaborate on, on that project because that, and in fact, if they had succeeded, that might have saved a lot of Jewish lives, right? Uh, if they had succeeded before Germany was completely enclosed by, um, uh, by uh, opponent, uh, opposing powers so that it could no longer, you know, basically send Jews away and, and then started to just mass murder them. If they had been able to send more Jews away sooner, for example, to Palestine, <clears throat> it would have saved a lot of Jews, actually, right? Jewish lives. But that's a that's a you know just a sideshow. But Lavo, again, the way I read Lavo is he's just simply saying to this Italian reporter, saying, "Oh, being a Jew and being a Nazi is not mutually exclusive." And I would just add in brackets, "No, on the contrary." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, especially in Israel, the Nazis are obviously alive and kicking today, <laughs> including in the government, possibly this Mr. Bennett himself. Right? Uh, not that he would ever call himself a Nazi, but it's, the, you know, the underlying ideology is very, very similar. It's not exactly the same, I know, but it's very, very similar. So he would never call himself a Nazi, but he would maybe not even admit to being a Zionist, perhaps. But you just have to, you know, read the, uh, you know, either the, the media in Israel or um, the, you know, the, the relevant pieces of the Bible, as long as they actually sort of uh, not, not necessarily believe in it, but pretend that that is the basis for their action. Yeah, there is a lot of things in there that the, the Nazis would have said, yeah, that's just like us. <laughs> Yeah, so it's all a little more complicated than people make it out to be. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> no war today is the Holocaust or is like the Holocaust. Yeah, if you if you compare anything with the Holocaust, you're in trouble with the uh, Israeli censors because they have now <clears throat> so occupied that term Holocaust, which by the way is a Greek word, nothing to do with um, uh, you know, the 20th century, you know, an ancient word for, for burned offering, right? Which is a typical offering all over the, the Near East in, in the past, right? Um, so that it's, it, it doesn't have a negative connotation at all to start with. It was then used apparently by some reporter uh, in conjunction with the uh, purported genocide of the Armenians, of some Armenians by Turks in the early 20th century. That was apparently the first time that term, that ancient term, was used in a modern context, in a context of, if you like, genocide or ethnocide or something along those lines. As I say, I, I don't believe the 
I don't believe in these labels easily because they, they're all misleading, but you know, that's the language that's being used, right? And then somehow this word Holocaust got then sort of allocated to the mass murder of the Jews uh, during the Nazi era, right? I mean, it's, fairly, it's perfectly correct that six million Jews lost their lives, were, were murdered. There's no doubt about that, right? But to label that the Holocaust is already a bit misleading because that term was, it's a generic term. It was first, as I say, used for the mass murder of Armenians, and it could be used for the mass murder of, you know, any, any group, or in fact, it could be used for other things other than mass murder because the burnt offering doesn't have to be a mass murder, <laughs> right? Uh, maybe a single lamp is offered for a burnt offering, and not, not the whole herd, right? So the, 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 how these words are being used is anyways misleading, but the point here is that the Israelis, <clears throat> or some Israelis, not all of them, for sure, if I say the Israelis, I know it's not everybody, but a certain, certain number of people, and not only in Israel, also in some other parts of the world, have chosen and are now imposing on us a usage of the word Holocaust that is unique and exclusive. They, they, they basically have, uh, have um, acquired, they think, a, uh, uh, an exclusive right to the term. Yeah, and it, it, it cannot denote anything other than the killing of the six million Jews uh, during World War II, right? which is, of course, nonsense, right? This word can be used in many other ways, but no, if you do, <clears throat> you're in trouble. <clears throat> yeah, and that is just because the whole ideology of the state of Israel today is that they are the, the big victims, right? <laughs> and that's why they are allowed to do all these crimes against the, the neighbors, the Palestinians or whatever, right? Because they are the big victims, right? And so anybody who said, well, maybe, wait a minute, maybe there are some other victims. <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> there's the Holocaust, meaning in brackets, killing of six million Jews, and there's nothing else. <laughs> so this is sort of, um, uh, uh, acquiring for themselves this sort of exception, right? The Jews, just like the Nazis, think of themselves or of their whatever group or if ethno religious group or whatever it is as exceptional, right? So the normal rules of engagement between human beings do not apply to them, right? Because they are special, right? And that's exactly what the Nazis also felt, right? They felt it for the so-called Aryan race, right? Which I said last time, of course, does not exist, right? It's just an illusion. Just like the Jewish nation does not exist. It's also just an illusion, right? <clears throat> So these are just illusions, but they are so powerful and people defend them. <laughs> as you can hear, they jump at any opportunity to defend them as if their life depends on it. And maybe their life does depend on it because they made it so. <laughs> Um, yeah, what is, what does it say here? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, reversal, the victims become the criminals. Yeah, of course, today it's the Jewish people, if I may use that term, in Israel, who are the biggest perpetrators of crimes against humanity, yeah. <laughs> and ironically, on the basis that they were before the biggest victims. <laughs> so it's this logic like, you know, it's, it's, you would have thought they come out and says, oh, never again. We never want to see any of this kind of victimization of anybody again. That would have been a learning where you would have said, oh, they've learned something, you know, and they've, they've, you know, they've grown uh, those who survived, let's say, have, you know, but the opposite is the case. They say, oh, because we have now been the victim in the past, we now have an automatic right to victimize everybody else. <laughs> so it's the worst possible um, learning you could draw from you know, from the so-called Holocaust, as they call it, right? Um, yeah, so, which is, which is tremendous, right? It's just, I mean, it could not have been any worse than that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> okay, uh, we'll test, this is interesting. So, um, um, Mr. Lovegoff's comments will test Israel's relation um, in a context of the Israeli government not taking a tough enough line with Putin. Yeah, well, how could they? I mean, Israel is doing exactly the same in Palestine, what Putin is doing in the Ukraine, right? Land grabbing 
stealing land on the basis of some historical construct. We were there before. <laughs> Israel is doing exactly the same thing for the last 75 years, day after day after day. So yeah, it would be a little bit funny if they came out too strongly criticizing Putin because someone, someone might have the idea, oh, aren't you doing the same thing? <laughs> Yeah, so they are not so critical of Putin because for them that's the normal state of affairs that you that you steal your neighbor's land. <laughs> Actually, the Bible somewhere says I saw a quote I forgot in which book uh, <clears throat> that you know God God said specifically you should not uh, violate the borders of your neighbor. And it, it said in the sense of do not remove the border stone of your neighbor's land. I think that's how it's expressed in the Bible. It's very beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> Evidently, to be a Jew maybe means to not read that part of the Bible. <laughs> Sorry for the Jews. I know there are many Jews who, who do not support, uh, you know, uh, crimes against humanity. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, I don't want to now box people myself, right? But it's, it's, it's often difficult to talk about something. If everybody does this boxing of people into boxes, to, to, to not do that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> anyways, let's go back to this case. So what actually happened is that there was actually, <clears throat> apparently a, a, a real, apparently, I mean, from what I can read here, uh, I wasn't there, right, uh, 200 years ago, uh, or 150 years ago, there was a, a, apparently a um, a real sense that Hitler's grandfather in Austria may have been Jew, okay? And this came via his lawyer. Apparently, he asked his lawyer to investigate because they had his, his estranged uh, um, nephew, who was an anti-Nazi and uh, I think had emigrated to the UK or the US, claimed this and Hitler himself was not sure actually, right? Whether there was any truth to that. And so he secretly asked his lawyer, Mr. Frank to investigate. At least so Mr. Frank then later wrote in his, in his uh, memoirs or in his uh, books that he later wrote. Um, I mean, I can here only rely on what I can find on, you know, Google. Right? I haven't done a major effort to really investigate this in all depths, but it's an interesting thing. So I hear the nephew, William Patrick Hitler, he blackmailed uh, his uncle and uncle tries to find out. And this Mr. Frank, his lawyer, finds out, yes, there, <clears throat> there is some suggestion that this uh, Mr. Frankenberger, who was the grandfather, could have been a Jew. But then there was also a dismissal of that because some researchers, scholars have pointed out that at that time in, in, in Styria, um, which is the province of Austria where the grandfather lived, that there were no Jews, right? Which is a bit iffy, right? How would you? exactly know that. Yeah, yes, they did then do some regular population polls and maybe they asked people what's your religion, but not everybody would tell the truth, right? You can't force people to click, uh, tick, tick the right box, right? So, <clears throat> yeah, but so there was for a long time, the scholars have um, denied this and said, no, there's no evidence. And it's unlikely, very unlikely, because at the time of this uh, grandfather's life, Frankenberger and family, there are not, no, no Jews registered in that part of Austria. So, you know, they, they couldn't have been Jew, but, you know, it's not as simple as that because someone who more recently went in and did a, maybe a more thorough study <clears throat> actually found that uh, that's not the case, that they were in fact an active, but small, but active Jewish community in Graz, in, in, in uh, Styria at that time. So, that doesn't prove, of course, that uh, Hitler's grandfather was a Jew, but it, uh, it just suggests it's totally possible. Yeah. Uh, and there are some other indications that may uh, suggest that, in fact, he may have been, right? But that we don't know, right? But it is it's the possibility that Hitler, in, in uh, uh, Lavrov's uh, terms, had Jewish blood. <laughs> 
cannot be excluded. Yeah. And there's no, I mean, we can't prove it either, but we cannot disprove it uh, either. Right? And that goes back to H.G. Wells' quote. That's, I think, why I brought that quote at the very beginning. Remember, he said, races are all mixed up. There's no such thing as a clear race because, you know, people mingle, right? And they have been doing that for the last 45,000 years, you know, since we've been Cro-Magnon, Homo sapiens sapiens, right? So it's, it's all in a way nonsense, this labeling, right? And so, yes, of course, it's possible that someone in Hitler's ancestry was confessed to the Jewish faith, for example, or considered themselves Jewish, right? And were maybe circumcised or whatever it takes, whatever it is that defines <laughs> Jewishness, which, as I said, I'm not sure, I don't know what it is, but, you know, uh, that person, that grandfather may have met those criteria. That's totally possible, right? And <clears throat> the question really is, uh, oh, yes, uh, one more thing is, you know, I checked up Hans Frank's as a lawyer. I wanted to see, can I maybe read his, his diary? Because apparently that's where he, and it turns out his diary, his private diary has, has never been published, right? Which is very odd, and you can you can you can access the original in the federal archives in Koblenz, which is like I, I studied in Koblenz. I know the it's this very modern building that looks like a fortress, and I'm sure you know they need to protect their documents from fire and so on. But but you know it's like a fortress, and you know I think to get access to Hans Frank's diary, you probably have to be a professor at a university or something like that and show that you have a funded research program, but it's not for you and I. <laughs> Which led me to the common, the main source of conspiracy, because they talk about the, the, these are all conspiracy theories, da, 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 is official censure, right? If you don't public make public these writings, you know, then people will make, uh, Wild ideas, right? <laughs> so it's it's governments who hide certain information that leads to conspiracy theories. Right? And here we are. The, the the private diary of Mr. Hans Frank, where apparently he talks about the possibility of Hitler being Jewish, is not published, publicized. You know that until just a few years ago, it was illegal to own a copy of Hitler's book Mein Kampf even though that's from a historical point of view, one of the most important books ever written. It's a terrible book, I read it, I read it secretly. I have it, I, my grandmother sort of hid it in the garden, <laughs> she didn't want to throw it away. <laughs> so I have, I have these good old, you know, 1940s standard copy of Mein Kampf and I actually read it and it's a terrible book, but it's a historical document of the first order. And until, I don't know, five years ago, it was illegal in Germany to own a copy. So I illegally owned a copy all these years. <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> that's censor. You, you disallow people from reading those things that really matter. Right? I mean, if you really want to understand what happened in those years and how Hitler you know, thought, the first thing you need to do is read his book. <laughs> And yes, again, it's a terrible read, but you know, if you want to know what happened, the first thing you have to do is read his book. It wasn't allowed. Yes, if you were, again, if you were at university and you made your research project and you applied, then, then maybe you were allowed to read it. Right? And so since then they have um, issued an, an, uh, officially an annotated copy. So, <laughs> so <clears throat> the restriction on owning a copy apparently expired a few years ago and the government decided not to extend it which is good but with the caveat that uh, any new republished version could only be published with an extensive annotation by experts <laughs> so they have now published Mein Kampf republished uh, apparently a very well done book from, from what I, I haven't got it it's, it's big and expensive but it's got more annotation, then it has the actual original text. It, it does have the original text, I hope unexperged, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, it does have so much commentary. So it's basically, uh, apparently, uh, the, the idea is, yes, you're allowed to read it, but only by allowing yourself to be brainwashed by these so-called experts who tell you what you're supposed to read <laughs> into this. So don't interpret it yourself, it's too dangerous. <laughs> only experts can interpret this text, right? <laughs> 
21st century, <clears throat> medieval methods. <laughs> you remember how they burn books? We still, basically this is the modern 21st century version of book burning. <laughs> Don't ever dare to think for yourself. Uh, if you're not expert, you cannot inter you cannot understand what Hitler was saying. <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. So, did Hitler have Jewish blood? I'm using Mr. Lavrov's uh, terminology. A uh, answer, of course, we don't know. <laughs> it's possible, of course. Oh, any one of us can have Jewish blood, right? Any one of us could have an ancestor somewhere who considered themselves Jewish. <laughs> nobody, nobody on this planet can exclude that possibility. <laughs> sure, in some cases, maybe extremely unlikely. Right? <clears throat> if you are an Eskimo and you know your whole family tree, for all you know, has been always Eskimo, not so likely that maybe a Jewish person infiltrated, <laughs> but it's not impossible. <laughs> So, so <clears throat> we don't know, it's possible, but it doesn't matter. Right? That's the first answer. It's completely irrelevant. Or answer number two, that is also, I think, truthful. It, there's no such thing <laughs> as Jewish blood. <laughs> so the, whole, the question is meaningless. Right? It's either the question is meaningless or the answer is it doesn't matter. Um, and, and, and neither do we need this kind of thing, this kind of category, right? <laughs> I mean, people, yes, you, you can categorize things as much as you want, and it's all like, yeah, it's not illegal, you're allowed to do that, you, you know, but it, it's not called for, right? It doesn't do anything other than mayhem and trouble, right? And answer number three, and so far, as I said at the beginning, as Lavrov uh, meant to say that being a Nazi and being of Jewish descent are not mutually exclusive, he is, of course, correct. Right. So those are the three, I think, plausible answers to this question. Um, hypocrisy. Uh, I think that was my the reason I brought this up. I, I thought it was fascinating, so I spent a bit of time researching it on, on Google, and uh, not a lot of time, like maybe an hour. But uh, yeah, I was just curious because I'd never heard about this before, so it was a new thing. And I, oh, that's interesting. Hitler. <laughs> so it's a more interesting person than you might think, right? Uh, <laughs> so he actually secretly asked his lawyer, apparently, I mean, according to the lawyer, right, um, to investigate his, his descent. Uh, how funny. Um, but this hypocrisy, right, especially on the part of the uh, Israeli. Uh, uh, I mean, Lavrov was just sort of making this up on the fly, right? Just as an excuse for their saying, oh, we want to denazify. The leadership of the Ukraine. Right? This is nonsense. But then he said, yeah, but when he was challenged, oh, but this guy is a Jew. How, you know, you think he could be a Nazi? Yeah, of course he could be a Nazi. Of course there could be a Jewish Nazi. And in fact, there are many of them, right? <laughs> Especially in Israel, you can find, uh, but also in the US and in other places, you know, lots of them. Um, but this hypocrisy, then immediately the Israeli government, you know, oh, how dare you, how can you compare, we are special, we are unique, and we are the only suffering victims on this planet, da 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 da. I, I, I can't believe this is happening in the 21st century, we are in the year 2022, and we have learned nothing, nothing. Okay, we move on. Uh, just quickly on the so-called war in Ukraine. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some movement. Um, the Russians are slowly but surely advancing in the Donbas. And you can't see that here because I always give you the snapshot, which is as per today. And I, I'm not going to show you the, ma uh, the map as it was one month ago. I could, but, you know, it's, it's almost difficult to see because the the advances are quite minuscule, but they're real. And they just announced that they have... Um, largely occupied the main city uh, that they hadn't yet occupied in the uh, Luhansk uh, region, which is down here uh, in the Donbas. So, I mean, the Russians are advancing, there's no doubt. They're throwing a lot of material and people at it, massively. Uh, people have, they say that we've stopped counting the victims because it's just too many, we can't count them and things are moving uh, too fast. And there's so many trenches where, you know, dead bodies are just piling up, so it's very ugly. It's this kind of ugly grinding through the Donbas. Clearly, as we had uh, suspected, with the objective of getting, you know, everything that is in this oval here. Um, that's basically the yellow part 
is what the Russians don't have yet, but that they probably want to have because that's sort of the historical, as you talked about previously, is sort of that's the common definition of the Donbass is sort of provincial boundaries there. And by and large, that's probably what the Russians want. Now, the um, Ukrainians have been mounting some uh, counteroffensive with some success in Kharkiv. They have um, already, I think last time when we spoke, they have been able to not only defend the city, second biggest city in the country, so very important, <clears throat> but also they have pushed the Russians back and out of the reach of standard artillery, which is maybe about 30 kilometers or so. So, so the, the Russians are no longer pounding Kharkiv on a, on a daily basis, uh, or if they do, they need more long range rockets, which they have, but they don't have as much of as of standard artillery, right? So at least standard artillery is out of reach. And uh, I think from what I see, the Ukrainians seem to be continuing to make some progress pushing the Russians towards the Russian uh, the frontier there, you know, hopefully uh, being able to free that part of Ukraine up there eventually. And uh, similarly, in the Kherson region, which is here in the south, they've made some progress. It's, it's, it's glacial, it's like one village at a time, but they are closing in, I mean, the Ukrainians are closing in on Kherson. Remember we said last time, the Russians were thinking about declaring Kherson an independent republic or make, doing, doing some kind of a uh, uh, plebiscite, uh, you know, to see whether the people would want to be part of Russia or something like that. And I think they know, they realized the majority of the population wouldn't. So I think they haven't gone through with their plebiscite. But, um, you know, for the Russians, uh, Kherson is a very important city. It's not huge, it's 300,000 people or so, but it's a strategically very important city. It's sort of the gateway towards the Crimea. And also from or the reverse from the criteria uh, Crimea to Odessa, which is the remaining Black Sea port that the Ukraine hasn't lost yet, and which is very strategically important to both them and the Russians, right? So Kherson is important. Both sides know that, and 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 so both sides are battling for it. The Ukrainians seem to have at the moment a bit the the upper hand uh, around Kherson, but they haven't made significant. Uh, advances, relatively modest advances, right? So in a nutshell, you know, modest advances by the Russians in the Donbas, modest advances uh, by the Ukrainians near Kharkiv and near Kursa. That's basically, it's all very glacial, it's uh, very slow moving, but a lot of material and, and lives being thrown at it on both sides. Right? And the Ukrainians are saying what we need most is, you know, more powerful, more long range missiles so we can really hit the Russians, their supply, their supply lanes, you know, that's where the Russians have the clear advantage over the Ukrainians, right? And the US is now debating whether they should give them rock, multiple rocket launches with, you know, reach of maybe 50 to 80 kilometers. Um, I don't think they will give them any more long range than that because they're very worried of, you know, these rockets then landing on Russian soil and then the Russians basically saying American weapons landing on Russian soil, we, we consider that a declaration of war <laughs> by, on the part of the US. And I think they, the US is very carefully avoiding that, which I think is, is right um, and very understandable. So the rockets, they will give the um, Ukrainians maybe a bit more short range, but long, you know, enough to allow the Ukrainians to hit uh, Russian, you know, troop movements and supply uh, lanes, you know, supplying their troops in the Donbass, right? So that could be a bit of a game changer if that happens. In terms of the sanctions, there's been a little bit of a game changer, maybe half a game changer in that the EU has decided to cut off most of uh, Russian oil, that's significant, that's a lot of income. And yes, the Russians will try to find markets elsewhere, but that will take some time and they will have to sell their oil at a significant discount to get new customers, et cetera, et cetera. So it does hurt them. It's not as important as gas. Remember, we spoke mostly about gas, but it is still an important source of, uh, um, of, of euro, of, of hard currency for Russia. And you know that's, that's been curtailed to a significant degree, not 100% because Ukraine and sorry, uh, in, uh, Hungary and uh, maybe uh, two other countries, the Czech Republic and maybe Slovakia, uh, opposed the complete stop because they depend on it. Da, da, da. Okay, fine, typical EU compromise. But by the end of this year, they say 90% of Russian oil will, will 
no longer be bought by the EU. Um, okay, so that's that's a, at least a partial success that is that is significant in terms of reducing Russian funding for the war, right, and Russian income, at least for some time. And it will take them a while to make up for it somewhere else, even though they will be trying, of course, but it will take them some time. It will, they may not be able to fully make up for it. So that, that, it, it, that's the first sanction that probably really hurts them economically in a significant way. So that's sort of a progress there, but <clears throat> the Zelensky says, well, too little, too late. You know, you should have done that like two months ago. Why did it take you so long to debate it? Yeah, yeah, well, that's the EU. <laughs> He wants to be part of the club, so you better get used to it, Mr. Zelensky. Okay, so that's it. Um, with that, we go on to talk about COVID and take a quick one minute breather. Hmm, yeah, good, 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 good. Oh, yeah, let's see. So here is just a bunch of uh, random media things that I've seen uh, over the last months that I wanted to share before we go to the numbers. Um, <laughs> health officials in some countries are questioning the merits of repeated mass testing. <laughs> And they, apparently they question it on the, on the basis of cost. Yeah, of course it's costly, but remember what we said, it's not just that, the cost is far beyond just money. The cost is you're keeping the bulk of your population away from proper, properly exposing themselves to the full virus and therefore their immune system to get to know the virus as well as possible. You are preventing the bulk, meaning everybody who is not high risk, you're preventing those people with these marks vaccinations from basically having a normal life. This is a huge crime against humanity, this mass vaccination program. And it's not just because of the cost that it should be questioned, but there you are. So yeah, some governments are questioning, and you know, I, I, the, the numbers, uh, we'll talk about the numbers later, but you know, the, the numbers of vaccinations um, have dropped precipitously. I mean, they're, they're now getting close to like zero, <laughs> which is good, <laughs> except uh, it's not quite, again, one has to differentiate, that's the thing, right? Those who are really at risk and who thanks to the vaccine have not yet been exposed to the full virus, it may actually really be better for them to get like with influenza, to get, a, for example, an annual booster. You know, maybe the industry can produce a new booster every year that sort of takes into account the latest variants, da, da, da. And then those people who really feel vulnerable to it can have an annual booster until they die for the rest of their life. Maybe that's worth doing, which means their immune system will not by itself ever fully be exposed to this virus in its different variants. It will always be protected, shielded from that by, by a vaccine, because a vaccine is good for about a year, you know, so once a year before winter comes, kind of, you know, if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, or in the Southern Hemisphere for that matter, and somewhere, if you're away from the equator and you know what winter is, <laughs> then, you know, when winter comes or when autumn comes, even, even better, actually autumn, uh, so late September, early October, get your booster for the next year, right, and then you do that once every year, that, that may actually be rational. Yeah, so when I say, oh, vaccinations are good, falling down to zero, that's not actually really good either, right? It's just, what I'm, what I'm trying to argue against is this, everybody doing the same, this undifferentiated view of the world as to who, sh you know, most people don't need a vaccine, but some people do benefit from the vaccine, but they probably benefit from it only if they continue to take it then. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, they have already benefited from the first two shots, I mean, those who are at risk, <clears throat> right? And that's good. And, and I think the risk of ever getting seriously sick is already lowered, but it is not as low as it could be if they continue to boost once a year, for example, or once every, every so often. That is something for the experts to figure out. Right? But <clears throat> all I'm advocating is that people who are really at risk, they may actually continue to benefit from, from 
uh, you know, boosters on, a, on an annual basis or so, whereas everybody else doesn't need a vaccine. Right? That's, that's, the, that's the differentiation. Right? And that's where we got it completely wrong. And as I've argued before, this has cost a few million lives that we didn't get this right. We had the vaccine and we misused it, abused it almost. And it backfires in the long run because so many of us have been prevented from <clears throat> being properly exposed to the virus on a regular basis. So maybe we've been infected by the virus once. So we've had one of the five or six or seven relevant uh, variants, but not the others, right? Well, of course, we are not only because of vaccines, also because of lockdowns, and also because naturally you don't always get infected with every variant that comes along, right? It's probably the same with all uh, common cold viruses, and that's okay. You know, uh, you know that's just nature, right? You will, and depending on how interactive you are and where you live and how population densities and so on and so on. Some people just get exposed more to cold viruses than others, right? Natural, that's, that's normal, right? But the whole population has had less exposure because of all these measures. And that's on the whole is negative right? and it will backfire. It means we are more vulnerable going forward than we, should, we, we could have been, simply because we were not permitted to expose ourselves to the virus. Yeah. And so here, so, so when I see this, um, and then they debate about it and say, how, you know, oh, maybe like your Denmark, oh, we did so many tests, but statistically their death rates are similar to other countries that did a lot less of that testing, right? So was it really necessary? Of course not. I mean, the tests, sorry, this is about tests and this is not about a vaccine. So maybe I got confused just now, but um, testing is almost irrelevant, right? I mean, we should have not tested anybody other than those who have clear symptoms of a pneumonia, right? And then, yes, you want to know, is it a viral or not? And you do the PCR test and then you know, oh, it's a conjunction with COVID-19, uh, sorry, with um, SARS-CoV-2 and, and therefore, you know, antivirals may be in order and therefore we know what to expect kind of thing. It can be quite tough on this person because they haven't exposed to this virus before. So yes, as part of a diagnostic of someone who is severely ill, the, the PCR test is wonderful. It's a wonderful invention. It was just massively abused. 99.9% .9 of those people who have been tested PCR, have been tested several times, didn't need that test. It didn't do anything. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> But okay, I mean, being tested is not harmful in terms of our immune system. It's not like the vaccination that I talked about. But it is, it has just screwed up our lives. I mean, you couldn't cross borders without being multiple tests. And I talked about this also. Borders are not relevant to a virus. So the idea that, oh, when you cross a border, you have to be tested is complete nonsense. Um, yes, of course, because every government says, yeah, but we do it better than our neighbor, but that's nonsense. <laughs> You can't do this in isolation. This is a global phenomenon. This virus is global. It only knows one humanity. It also doesn't know races. <laughs> anyway, so, so now they're coming back slowly and questioning some of the things that were done. I guess that's my point. <clears throat> Here it continues. But, but the way they question this is still wrong. They still haven't understood the, the, the fundamentals of what this was. So they're questioning, oh, the effectiveness is not clear because in, in countries with a lot of testing, the death rates were similar to countries without a lot of testing. Yeah, of course. <laughs> you don't need to do a study to see that. Right? Testing doesn't prevent anything. And then, oh, and we, maybe we, it's too costly and not necessary. Yeah, it's, a, it's not necessary. <laughs> B, yes, it's costly, but the being costly is, is a secondary uh, issue. <clears throat> the primary issue is that you're imposing on individual human beings a test that they don't need. Right? <clears throat> and I've argued before, it's like a rape. You, know, you get this thing stuck up into your nose, rammed up your nose, or your throat, or both. It's rape. Right? But they don't talk about it that way. No, just, maybe we don't need it because A, we don't, we're not sure that it's really effective, and it's so expensive. So it's purely economic rationale for not doing all this testing. Yeah? which misses the point, right? It's not wrong, but it just misses the main points altogether, which is, this is much worse than just being costly. Okay, um, modeling transmission Omicron. 
waning of immunity, they've calculated 1.55 million deaths. Well, a few months ago, they calculated 2 million deaths if they, per year and for maybe a couple of years, which is closer to the truth, I think, than this. But okay, they've got a different model here now and say, oh, so we cannot, we cannot let people have a normal life because 1.55 million people would die of pneumonia. Yeah. Yeah. So instead of letting 1.55 million people die a natural death, pneumonia being the most natural of all death, you rather lock 1.4 billion people up forever. Deny them a normal human life forever. Because you can't stop, right? This is zero COVID because the virus doesn't go away. So you cannot stop. <laughs> if you really mean it seriously with zero COVID, you have to do it for the rest of history <laughs> until the end of history. Right, And all of that to save 1.5 million lives of people who are on average 80 years old and anyway is quite vulnerable to infectious diseases. And if they don't die of this one, they'll probably die of another one. Yeah. But it's true that, yeah, of course, if you, know, you just take the, uh, uh, the uh, infection um, uh, rate of this virus, uh, the fatality, sorry, the infection fatality uh, rate, IFR, and apply it to you know China, adjusting it to their local conditions in terms of age structure and prevalence of uh, you know the various risk factors. And you know, yeah, one point five five is probably too low. Uh, you know, it's going to be maybe you know three or four million in, in, in my back of the envelope kind of guess, right? Uh, over two or three years, not in one year, but over two or three years. Yeah, but that's out of one point four five billion people, all of whom, remember, will die, right? We are, we are not actually debating here, oh, these people would otherwise not die. No, 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 they anyways die, right? It's just how they die and when they die is at stake, right? And the, the, the ideology here is you're not allowed to die of infectious diseases because that is so human. That's the most human of all death, right? The most typical death that most humans in the history of humanity have died is of infectious diseases, right? No, that's too human. So that's not allowed. I mean, we can't allow people to have a human death, right? We want them to have an a human death, like, I don't know, cancer, something slow and nice, nice and slow. <laughs> cool. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So they die anyways. Remember, they just don't die of this particular infection. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And of course, their life expectancy, if they're on average almost 80, the life expectancy is of over five or six years, right? The remaining life expectancy. Right. And because by definition, these would be people whose immune systems is clearly no longer functioning well, otherwise they wouldn't have this problem. Therefore, their average life expectancy is anyway shorter than it would be on average. Right? Uh, anyways, we've been there, we've done that many times, but the, the Chinese are just sort of uh, basically crafting arguments, semi-rational, because not really rational, uh, why they have to continue with their zero uh, COVID policy. Um, Biden summit, nations um, pledge billions to bolster COVID-19 response. The response has been as bad as it could have been. It could, have, it could barely have been worse than it was. We've learned nothing. We have wasted 20 trillion in GDP for no reason. We have destroyed people's lives for two and a half years. And now people, either the Bill Gates of the world, oh, and we give billions in, to help people with COVID. The people don't need any help with COVID. They need to be left alone. They have an immune system. <laughs> By all means, help those people who are at risk, just as you do with you know, elderly who are at risk of influenza as well, right? because influenza can be just as fatal for elderly. Right? Yeah, by all means, that's a, just a public health thing. But all this big tum-tum about something, as I said, COVID-19 actually doesn't exist, right? It's just pneumonia, um, is, is silly, so silly, so silly. And I think the Bill Gates of the world, they really think they're doing something positive for mankind, but they aren't. No, they are taking away our individual right to look after ourselves, imposing on us with the help of money and with the help of rules, 
things that they believe for some reason that it's, it's, it's like a religion. I don't understand their religion, but they evidently have a religion or an ideology, which is the same thing that tells them, I must save the world. And oh, these other people, they are not able to fend for themselves. They're all little children. I, Bill Gates, and all these others, I don't mean to write on Bill Gates, he's just one of them, right? So he's the most prominent of them. Um, you know, uh, Biden and the German government is big in this as well, and so on. Uh, so I'm not, don't worry, I'm not just writing on Bill Gates. So he's just a type, right? An archetype. So this archetype of people who cannot respect that every one of us is an adult. And we are quite capable to think of for ourselves if, if we are allowed to. But some people just cannot accept that. They, they have an ideology or religion that somehow tells them, I must intervene on behalf of all these other people because these poor people, they cannot do it themselves. Oh, they are like little children. And that's, to, that's at the root of the problem here, that governments and some individuals, wealthy individuals and some organizations, all these do good you know, you know, UN agencies and so on, they all share the same fundamental belief, which I think is completely wrong headed, which is that they are called upon by some higher authority to impose their view of what's good for you on you because you don't know yourself what's good for you. That's the underlying assumption. And I think that is very, very, very sad and disturbing. But that's at the root of this whole so-called crisis. Right? <clears throat> Omicron infection turbo charges vaccinated people's immunity. So peu a peu, research is trickling in that basically just confirms what any thinking person already knows. <laughs> of course, if you add one infection to the other, whether it's vaccinated or not, I mean, as I said, vaccination is probably not as effective as a full frontal exposure to the virus because the vaccine only protects you in a certain way and doesn't teach your immune system everything there is to know about that variant. So it is a less effective way to teach you, but it does teach you something, right? But every new infection teaches your immune system something new because every infection is a bit different, right? It, it's a different variant probably. And even if it was the same variant, every infection is a bit different. Sometimes it's heavier, sometimes it's lighter, da, da, da. And so every exposure is like a teaching seminar for our immune system, right? Yeah, yeah. So we don't need research to understand that. <laughs> I mean, it's always nice to see how research sort of confirms what we already know, but can we, can we just start thinking a little bit? Because all of this is obvious, right? Of course it does, of course. And not just Omicron, right? Any new variant that comes your way will turbocharge your immune system. <laughs> That's how immune systems work. <laughs> yeah, so it's, 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 it's so silly to see these. Uh, there's a lot of people who earn a lot of money, researchers, and they get funds. And oh, and we found that Omicron, if you get exposed to it after vaccination, it improves your immune response. Yeah, no, of course it does. <laughs> I should be paid for what I'm doing. <laughs> I've been saying that for two and a half years now, because but I shouldn't be paid for it because it's so obvious, right? Everybody can see that, right? Except maybe these researchers. They somehow, they, they live in that little world where they don't believe anything that hasn't been proven empirically. I talked about this before, right? Everything else they don't believe. Right? So conceptual thinking or logic, they don't, they don't understand, right? If you just say, yeah, but it's logical. It, it cannot be any other way, logically, right? Then they say, oh, well, no, no, first we need empirical evidence. Otherwise we don't believe. So they just don't understand logic, basic, simple, logic, yeah, A and B and then follow C, right, something like that, right? they don't understand that, right, um, and partially because they refuse to understand that this is all about our immune system, so nobody is really looking at well, how is the immune system actually functioning, there's no expert, they, oh, we've had a thousand experts, but not a single one of them about immunology, oh, almost, I mean, a few at the beginning, and then they were never asked again, because everybody was focused on the virus, and so they got a thousand virologists telling them something about the virus, but the 
crux of the matter isn't the virus, the crux of the matter is our immune system, how it works. And once you understand that very basically, and it takes you about uh, 10 minutes, <laughs> you can read it up on, on Google and you know that's all you need to know. And then you know everything they tell you here in these research things, because you know, that's how our immune system works. All right, so Peking University. So I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a alumni of Peking University and so far I did a two months language program there uh, in, in Beida, uh, in, in, in Beijing. Uh, so I have a fondness and I have a fond memory of that time. I have a fondness for Beijing and uh, they have a track record of being a little bit rebellious, which is very rare and dangerous in China, but because it's the number one elite university in the country, and it, you know, it trains the future leaders. So they, they are a bit cautious to not clamp down on them too much. So they have a little more leeway than anybody else in China, if not a lot. Uh, here's the birthplace of the Tiananmen Square, Tiananmen Square protest in 18, 1989. Yeah, so that's Beida. And so they went on the barricades a little bit because they were so completely locked away into their dorms that you know, they could barely go anywhere. And, <laughs> So there has been some, there has been some loosening a little bit, and I just, you know, I just bought that because I'm an alumni and I have, a, I have a soft spot for for that university and those students there. There are even in China some human beings, and they're highly concentrated at Beida. Yeah, there are people who can actually think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you won't find very many of those outside Beida uh, and a few other universities, right? but you do find them there. Um, I've, I've actually met a couple, yeah, I mean, long ago. Mm -hmm. They exist, yeah. So there's even hope for China, that there's a little bit of humanity there. Um, how often can you be infected with uh, COVID-19? Yeah, first of all, you cannot be infected with COVID-19. You can be infected with SARS-2. <laughs> Two and a half years into this, they still don't know what they're talking about, right? You cannot be infected with COVID-19. COVID-19 is a so-called infectious disease, which I said is a misnomer, but that's the way it's, you know, but it's not an infection. The infection is uh, triggered by SARS-CoV-2, by a virus, right? So anyway, so they really, what they really mean, how often can you be infected with SARS-CoV-2? And the answer is, you know, any number of times, right? Uh, <clears throat> but what, the reason <clears throat> I highlighted something here in a different color, the coronavirus, so they're talking about SARS-CoV-2, is behaving more like four of its closely related cousins which circulate and cause colds year round. Ah, I think this may be the very first time, and this is, you know, May 2022, so 27 months or 28 months into this affair. The first time that I see in one of the publications that I have been like looking at, and I can't look at everything, um, someone pointing out that this virus behaves no different than the other common cold viruses, at least the four that are also coronaviruses. You know, and you know, the others are being not coronavirus, but other kinds of common cold viruses. We know viruses mostly. And I talked about that yeah, two and a half years ago. <laughs> Remember uh, the German virologist, I, I was listening to all the, 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 the podcasts and you know, in one of his early podcasts in about April 2020, yeah, April 2020. So about, let's say a month or so into the, the virus, you know, reaching Europe. Uh, on one of those uh, podcasts, you know, as an aside almost said, oh, maybe one day we'll realize it's just another common cold virus. And that's, and ever since, remember, I've taken that on and says, yeah, that is exactly what it is, because everything it does is consistent with that. Right? Every, and ever since for the last two years and a few months, everything the virus does has been consistent with it being just another cold virus, right? And that's what I've been saying all the way through. Here's the first time, more than two years later, that someone actually in writing dares to suggest that hmm, maybe this coronavirus isn't all that different than all these other coronaviruses. Exactly. It, it is not different at all. Right? <clears throat> it is only different in that it is new. And the other four we already knew for a long time. So we grew up with them and therefore we, they hardly ever make us any problem. Why? Because we grew up with them. This one is new. So those of us like me who are already 57, I don't have the benefit of growing up with the thing, right? And that's why it's more risky. Not because the virus is any different, it's just because I am different. <laughs> My immune system hasn't encountered it. That's the only difference. 
Whereas the other uh, common cold viruses, it has encountered many times when it was young and learned to react very well to them, right? And most of us will learn very well to react to this one as well, right? It's just the older you are, the more likely that something goes wrong. That's all. That's all there is to this whole affair, right? It's so simple, right? <clears throat> and it's sort of piecemeal in these articles now that are now coming out. You start seeing some people bit by bit realizing some parts of it, but nobody coming out and just saying, look guys, here's what it really is. Other than me and my little video uh, things that nobody listens to. <laughs> nobody who has a voice coming out and saying, okay guys, let's just actually, you know, call a spade a spade. <laughs> right? Someone eventually will have to come out and say, actually, this was just a common cold virus and here's how it works. But maybe that will never happen because every single government on this planet will be wrong footed with the possible partial exception of Sweden. Every single government will look stupid, which they are. They've been very stupid about this, but they, the, the point is they will never admit to that and they will never want that to come out. <clears throat> Yeah, it's all been wrong and it's all been, you know, completely useless exercise, <laughs> but nobody will ever admit to that. Right? Expert panel backs boosters for children 5 to 11. The point here is what the expert panel determines is, oh, it's harmless. So yeah, children can take it. Yeah, of course it's harmless and children can take it. But what they're not saying is, oh, in brackets or, you know, even maybe in bold, but they don't need it. And in fact, it's counterproductive to give it to them because it's better for them, for the immune system to get that full exposure. So don't give it to them. Yeah. Or because the question posed to them is not, should I give the vaccine to the children? The question posed to them is, is it harmful to give them? See, that's the problem with all these experts. They only respond to the question that a politician very deliberately puts to them, right? If you ask these so-called experts, well, should we give it to children, they will probably say, probably not, right? And they will be maybe guarding themselves, they would be more cautious than I, who says, no, definitely not, right? I say definitely not, but they would probably say, ah, oh, probably not on balance, maybe the child doesn't really need it, there's no evidence that the child really benefits, it's harmless, so yes, you can give it, but then again, it's not clear that it's a good idea. That, uh, so they would, you know, they would wiggle themselves around, whereas I just say, it's very clearly not a good idea to give it to your children, because it's gonna limit your immune systems uh, learning to live with this virus, but it is not disastrous either, you know, because the, the immune system will still get its way. Yeah, uh, in, in almost all cases, right? Just a bit slower, right? Um, so don't give your children any, any vaccine, it's my, my view, but even if an expert would be very, very guarded and cautious, they would say, ah, oh, maybe you don't really need to, right? But that's not the question posed to them. See, the point here is they are being asked, is it harmful to give the vaccine? You know, not, should we give the vaccine in the first place? That is not, at, that the experts are not being asked about that fundamental question, right? Because that, the politicians keep that for themselves and say, I make the decision that I want children to be vaccinated, right? <laughs> I, the president of the US who has understood nothing about this virus and about our immune system, I want all the children to be vaccinated, boom. And I won't ask a single expert what they think about that. No, 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 I just ask the expert, is there any risk associated with my political choice, right? In the sense of, oh, could it be harmful for children? Then maybe I wouldn't make that choice, right? Because it would backfire on me, oh, Biden, you know, kill people, children because he forced a vaccine on them. I don't want that, right? So I want to, this is like an insurance policy for the politician. Like, oh, the experts told me it's harmless, so therefore I chose to do this, right? But he didn't ask the expert whether it's harm, what's the opposite of harmless? <laughs> whether it's, you know, a positive thing for the child, because it isn't. <laughs> <laughs> but they, they don't, the politicians don't ask the experts the right questions, right? I still remember how this th same virologist uh, who brought me onto the track that this is just another common cold virus and who was very profound at the beginning uh, talking about the virus, more and more as the politicians reached out to him, he was very popular and prominent in Germany for a while. And, you know, Merkel had him on her side several times. But, but the questions she would pose to him is, um, 
should we keep the windows in the schools open or closed if we allow the children to go to school? <laughs> and he would then give his expert advice whether you should have the windows open or closed. <laughs> <laughs> which in the hierarchy of importance is somewhere at the very bottom. <laughs> but that's the kind of questions the so-called politicians ask the so-called experts. And the experts just comply. So you wouldn't say, oh, for Merkel, you're asking me the wrong question. The question you should be asking is whether children can go to school, because the answer is yes, of course they can go to school. But you don't ask me that. You ask me whether the windows should be up, uh, open or closed. And so I give you the, uh, you know, my best answer to that. <laughs> what a waste of intelligence. <laughs> Birth rates rose slightly in 2021. This is US. Remember, they dropped quite pre precipitously um, in the last two years because of COVID, but or in the last year, actually. They've come up a little bit, not strongly. So there is some suggestion that maybe COVID really has um, reduce birth rates, but that's too early to say, because it could also be that next year it's really fully back on track. Right? So the question is, <clears throat> does it compensate for the loss and then overcompensate a bit and then back on track, or is it permanently going to be a bit lower? Right? In many uh, previous major drops during war time, for example, the population growth came straight back and you know overcompensated after the war was over and then the, the trend line was virtually unaffected and right? i think i showed some data before so the, the what we don't know yet here is with covid is is that also the case that we're going to be back on the same trend line so there has been no net effect or is it going to be different right? permanently different and I would say this initial data here suggests, well, it could be actually, it could have put the US at least, it's just the US, it could have put it on a somewhat lower trend line permanently. Yeah, it's possible, but uh, we don't, it's too early to really conclude that, right? It's just, we are not excluding that. So, I mean, if, if this year the birth rate had already like fully bounced back, then we would say, no, no it obviously didn't but uh, it didn't have any kind of significant effect, right? But that is not the case, right? Uh, they only came back slightly. So it is possible that the US has been put on a permanently somewhat lower birth rate by this crisis. But we will need an, at least another year or two of data to be really sure. Um, <clears throat> First steps in reforming global health emergency rules agreed at World Health Organization. The World Health Organization is, is, is deeply implicated in this whole uh, mess around the COVID, so-called COVID crisis. I mean, they were one of the main perpetrators. They all belong in front of a court, but uh, instead of pursuing them uh, by law, they are being reelected and uh, emboldened with more rights and uh, uh, they will make us more and more trouble going forward. The, the, basically, the World Health Organization is now being emboldened by governments to be ever more imposing on the global population with their recommendations, their rules, their uh, definitions of what is a pandemic and so on and so forth. So I spoke about that before, how important it was that the World Health Organization wrongly, in my view, called this um, an, uh, an, uh, a pandemic because it then in turn gives the government sort of the green light, so they think, right? They, they pretend, oh, green light, but the World Health Organization said it's a pandemic, so we can do what we want. <laughs> we, we can break any, any basic uh, rule and any principles of our constitutions because the World Health Organization told us it's a pandemic. Right? So we will have more and more of that going forward. It's, uh, it's a terrible, 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 um, development. Actually, this should be abolished. I mean, I'm not against, mind you, uh, close collaboration on uh, medical uh, uh, matters, right? but this is purely political, right? nothing to do with medical, right? nothing. Yeah. It's, uh, it's basically an, ide uh, an ideology that now many governments are now using and abusing the World Health Organization to spread this ideology. Uh, which is a, sort of a Nazi ideology, right? It's like a, a hygiene, just like the Nazi ideology is a hygiene uh, ideology, right? A purity of race. And this one is a purity of um, our biological system. Uh, 
viruses are not supposed to be in our body. <laughs> I think I mentioned before, 8% of our DNA may have been created by viral transfer. We would not exist without viruses, but <laughs> that the World Health Organization would not understand, right? Because their horizon is one or two years and not, you know, tens of thousands of years, right? Um, but we wouldn't, in all likelihood, humans would not exist uh, if, if there weren't viruses to help with that horizontal transfer. Uh, an evolutionary crane, as, I, you know, as Dennett calls it. I, I talked about that before. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah, the ideology is no well, virus, bad, 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 bad. And, you know, it, uh, immune systems don't exist for them. They don't know that we have immune systems. Um, no, 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 it has to be medicine and vaccinations and anything that costs money and can be centrally organized is good, right? Anything that is individual and where the individual can sort of help themselves, no, that's not good. Imagine, where, where would we end up if every individual could take care of themselves? Oh my God, then we wouldn't need governments, right? We wouldn't need World Health Organization or any other organization, yeah, exactly. That's basically, in the end of the day, all these policies are self-serving, right? There's a huge number of, Civil servants and bureaucrats who's living, you know, who make a very good living by basically imposing themselves on others and not giving others the, the right to fend for themselves, right? And this is just being perpetrated now with, with new rules and, and new commitments. And yeah, uh, it's disastrous. Uh, Ong Ye Kung, uh, I happen to know that he's. he's a, the Minister of Health in uh, Singapore. So I happen to know him personally. Uh, I don't want to say anything about him here. Um, I mean, he's no different than any of the other Singapore bureaucrats. Okay. Um, World Health Organization should focus on COVID deaths, severe infections, and not, uh, what does he say? Uh, not case numbers. Yeah, that's great to say that after two and a half years, Mr. Ong Ye Kung. <laughs> that was quite obvious two and a half years ago. <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, the smart Singaporeans, you know, it only really took him two and a half years to figure that out. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, why, why would you publicly show that it took you two and a half years to figure something out that is so obvious. <laughs> a conscious effort to focus on the right metric. And this is a Singaporean government person whose entire life has been around, you know, the, the way Singapore is run as a country is basically by metrics, right? So their entire life consists in very carefully deliberating what metrics to use and then how we measure them, right? Because that's how they govern the whole population, right? Govern is the wrong word. It's really, it's, it's really whatever. You know, it's like a herd of cattle, right? You, you, you don't govern cattle, right? You kind of manage, yeah, you manage cattle, cattle, right? So Singapore government manages the population via a set of KPIs and metrics. And, you know, <laughs> that's what he's saying. Oh, after two and a half years, the, the enlightenment has come and Mr. Ong Ye Kong now has realized what are the best metrics for him to manage the population <laughs> according to his or his team's preferences. <laughs> He's right, he's right, but A, two and a half years too late. B, he's right for the wrong reasons because it's just self-serving, right? He's just saying, oh, I don't, you know, how, how can I best manage my herd of cattle, right? And he's just figured out, oh, because the death numbers are very small um, in Singapore and the um, hospitalizations are quite modest. Uh, in fact, official numbers anyways, right? I mean, this is not a free speech country, so who knows <laughs> what the real numbers are, but the official numbers are very, and, and I think what he has realized is that most people don't really care for those numbers. They don't feel threatened because they are so small, right? The people in Singapore feel threatened by the case numbers because they're always in you know, a few thousand every day, right? Oh, a few thousand, that sounds like a lot, right? Fatalities are maybe one or two, that doesn't sound like so threatening, right? So I think with Mr. Ong Ye Kung and, and, his, uh, and his sort of mafia have, have figured out that because they now want to move on and they don't want to, after having threatened 
the population for more, more than two years, deliberately threatened them and, and, and made them afraid of this as far as possible. They have U-turned recently, right? And they now want to move on with their economy and other things. And so they don't want to their people to feel afraid, right? So after hammering down on them on a daily basis on TV in big letters, case numbers, case numbers, case numbers, case numbers for now two years, that is 700 something days in a row, he all of a sudden now says, oh, forget about that number. Just, we just focus on the death numbers. And you know, on some, some days there's zero, some days there's one, or two, and people don't feel threatened by that. Right? They're so clever. I mean, he's very, very, very clever. Right? in terms of getting what he wants, which is power and, you know, how to, how to manipulate a population. Right? <laughs> but in terms of what you should actually measure, of course, he's right. Yeah. But for the last two years, he didn't do what was right because it didn't serve him because he wanted to, he wanted to scare everybody. And now he's decided I want the opposite. I don't, I no longer want to scare people because I want them to go back to work and work normally and be productive. Oh, so let's just change the metric. <laughs> and he couches this in like this insight. Oh, we've realized that maybe that metric wasn't the right one and we now take another one. It's so, I mean, you know, as if he has like a positive insight here that nobody else before him has had. Right? It's so interesting how this is packaged and communicated. And, you know, again, it's not about only a call. It's the entire Singapore government and as many governments in Asia. Singapore is just particularly effective at, at this game, right? At this communication and manipulation and uh, propaganda game, uh, more than most, but uh, you know, you find it everywhere, right? Um, there's no new insight here in what he says. It is just a change in their policy that makes them now change the metric. And basically, behind people's backs, downplay the case numbers that they previously upplayed and instead focus on numbers that nobody really cares about. In other words, I mean, as a resident in Singapore, the good news is the government is sort of trying to extricate themselves from the mess that they created. I, you know, yes, I could say that's a good news that they are, but just interesting to see how they do it, right? How manipulative, how deliberate. And I think they don't even notice this is so ingrained in Singapore, this thinking, this thinking in terms of metrics and you know, managing a population via KPIs is so ingrained. I think they don't even realize. Uh, interesting, yeah, there you go. Uh, Gelassenheit, <laughs> again. <laughs> Did I skip something? No, that was the last one, okay, yeah. Uh, oh, I, I'm good. I don't need another breathing exercise. Let's go. So I've uh, I've recently argued that finally, after uh, two years, <clears throat> in the last couple of months, the you know the global scenarios have trended a little bit towards early spring. Uh, and I've, last time I showed you a few examples of what was happening in the world. This time, I just want to know China and North Korea. So China. It's taking baby steps away from zero COVID, very deliberate and careful because it would never officially admit that it's going away from zero COVID, but it, it is in some ways, but very locally and selectively and carefully. But there are now several locations that have been permitted to actually uh, admit to fatalities. Yeah, so they're starting in more parts of the country to actually admit that even Chinese are mortal. <laughs> but they do it very carefully, very crafted, right? So very step by step slowly. So the numbers never look too big and da da da, right? And then location by location. So it's a very slow, sluggish movement towards basically somehow getting China maybe back to normal in a matter of a few years, maybe a decade at the current rate. <clears throat> yeah. So if you're thinking about where you want to retire, don't, don't pick China. <laughs> you will have COVID stories for many years to come. But the first step is made. And in North Korea, even this first step is made. In North Korea, they published, I think, about 60 fatalities. Yeah. 
And they don't talk about COVID, they talk about fever, but you know, they, at least they talk about something. <laughs> because up to, up to recently, they said, we, we don't have it. Right? It doesn't get to us. Right? <laughs> now, at least they say, yeah, we have some fatalities. We're very small, very, very few. We are so good at managing this thing. Right? But it is an opening. Right? So China and North Korea, which are sort of the last of the Mohicans, <laughs> uh, they're very carefully and craftily somehow rejoining the rest of the world because I think they are realizing that their zero COVID policy or their denial policy is, isn't, isn't helping them. Right? But they would never admit that. So they will not, they will not just U-turn. Um, they will just, they will slowly, like a big tanker ship, you know, sort of change course, hoping that nobody really notices <laughs> the contradictions, I mean, you know, contradictions in what they do, right? Uh, <clears throat> and what they do and what they say is not the same. <laughs> it's full of contradictions, but they they handle it in such a way that either people don't notice or people notice, but they anyways can't do anything about it because they know it's like that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. So um, infection levels are now rising very slowly. That's, you know, just because of methodology, because fewer and fewer people die. And my methodology is, you know, fatalities times IFR. So if the fatalities rise only very slowly, then of course the overall penetration rises only slowly. And also, <clears throat> it is to some degree just due to the summer having arrived, or in the, or at least the spring having arrived in the northern hemisphere, where most of the people live. You know, so we expect for the next few months, um, you know, fairly slow um, movement, and then maybe in late September or in October, it will probably spike up again. But again, the, what we are modeling goes up to. 100, it will not actually reach 100. It, yeah, it will reach 99.9 .9 eventually, maybe, or something like that. It's an asymptotic, the like approaching the 100% line. That's the way I measure it, right? Of course, in, in reality, if you measured all infections, many countries are already above 100% because so many people already have a second or even a third infection, right? But if you say I'm measuring the, you know, the percentage of population for first infection, and that cannot go above 100%. Right? So we are approaching the 100%. And you know there was a bit of the boost in the last few months because Omicron boosted this a bit. But now we are going back to a sort of fairly slow progression. So that's expected. Um, fatality is similar. We had this big bump up because we were on methodology. I started using the economist, and there was a Lancet study. And other uh, derivatives of the economist numbers. The economist numbers are a bit aggressive. I've talked about it. Uh, recently, the World Health Organization also published figures. There's so about 15 million, a bit lower. This is for as of 1st of January. They were closer to mine. We were mine were 14.3 at that time. But if I had used the India figures that the research provided at midpoint rather than at a low point, I would have been at 15.1. So 15 was. What the World Health Organization calculated was very much in line with what I calculated, but the Economist and the Lancet were a bit higher. And I've just decided instead of trying to argue with myself, which studies do I believe more? I mean, World Health Organization has one advantage, they can get official data, and they have one big disadvantage, they can only get official data. <laughs> and they don't really like to use non-official data, whereas the Economist is more flexible in you know, what they use, right? SMI. Right? So um, yeah, so I, I would not say I trust the World Health Organization uh, number more than the economist. In fact, if anything, I would probably trust it a little bit less, but I don't want to go into that game. And I don't want to, I thought about just taking those three different figures and just averaging them and giving them all equal weight, uh, weight right? Which is just a heuristic. Since I can't decide which study is better, then I just use, treat them equally and just give them equal weight. But then I thought, no, what I really want to do is because for a long time, my uh, COVID fatalities were at about 70% of ex excess mortality. So the other 30% being all other things that happened, right? People being killed uh, or committing suicides because of government policies, et cetera, huh? or not getting, uh, getting treatment on time because of frantic blocking whole 
whole uh, sections of, of, of health care centers and hospitals for so-called COVID cases and not uh, releasing that capacity for other serious illnesses and thereby you know, basically condemning people with serious illnesses to death <laughs> because they wanted to have that capacity ready just in case they needed it for COVID. There were all these kinds of things. Remember? So, yeah, so um, for a long time, that ratio seemed to be 70%. And so I'm just going back to that. And I just say, instead of, you know, averaging these numbers, it would come to something similar, by the way, it's not hugely different, but um, I just say, okay, my base number is actually the COVID fatalities, which I built bottom up. And that's, uh, if I just set that at 70%, so the total excess mortality is, you know, just that divided by 70%, right? So you can see in this month, it's slightly less than last time, uh, okay, it comes to bottom, it's below 20 million. If I had just continued using the economist and the Lancet, extrapolating on them, I would maybe now be at 21. You know, so it's a difference. Or even 22. Yeah, so it's like maybe a couple of million less. Yeah, and that sort of is roughly also in line with what the World Health Organization and my own previous figures maybe suggested. Right? So I'm comfortable with that, but basically it's just saying as a heuristic, um, the COVID fatality is 13.87 equals 70% of the number up there of the total excess mortality. And that just, so I've just hardwired that into my system now. And I, I'm going to just carry that forward. That makes my life easier because I don't have to check up the economist figures every time and then think about what do I do with the Lancet study that is only repeated like once a year? Or what do I do with World Health Organization figures probably also just being repeated once a year. So I would have to wait for 12 months until I get fresh data from them. How do I you know, interpolate from what they said last time until I get the new data next time, right? All this kind of shit, uh, which is you know, a lot of modeling effort for no real value because it, it won't make a huge difference. You know, I, I could just eyeball it. That's one solution. I just said, as a heuristic, I just stick to my 70%, which has served me quite well in the past. Um, yeah, so I just do that. So if next time, so in other words, going forward, the blue line will grow at the same rate as the green line. That's it. So the ratio will always be 70% or 70, you know, 70% and 100%. Right? Um, so I just grow them going forward. I just grow them at the same rate, and so so that their ratio always is seventy percent. That's that's it. It's very simple to do uh, in my model. Um, who knows what the exact number of excess mortality is, right? But I'm comfortable. It's just slightly below twenty million. That's sort of you know if you if you draw a line through my blue curve here from the very beginning, like a like a like an for an arc, it cut, gets you to somewhere around where it is now, right? maybe somewhere below 20 million, maybe 18. If, if, if I hadn't bumped it up with the economist figures and the, Lan the Lancet study was really what triggered it, remember? Because the economist figures I was a bit dubious about, but the Lancet study I felt was a, a credible study. And so that became my anchor and that's why I had to bump it up, right? But um, they also leaned a lot on the same data as the economists. So there's a bit of that. And so I don't mind going a bit down, especially since it's closer to what I myself had bottom up generated. Right? Uh, and I always said, yeah, the economist has more data than I do. Uh, but they also seem to have some really exaggerated data in some areas. But who am I then to say that, right? So I just had a gut feel because I've been tracing this for so long. You just sort of develop a gut feel, but it's just a gut feel more than more, right? So I ended up saying the Lancet study really was a game changer and I really bumped it up, but uh, maybe a little bit too much, especially after the World Health Organization study came out. Okay, let's get some kind of like a number that is in line with the big official numbers out there because who am I to know so differently than that? The difference is, of course, I had these numbers two years ago already, or 18 months ago, which nobody else did, right? Except, uh, sorry, except the economists. The economists, in fact, they may have been before me even. They were very quick to do this analysis. I have to give them great credit for that. But other than the economists and I, there doesn't seem to be anybody until recently to have this idea, right? 
Um, what the economist doesn't have is the green line, which is the, really the one we are most interested in. Uh, I think the economist doesn't have that because they don't have a way of modeling actual COVID fatalities, right? Because they never dare to use the IFR, which is the main engine. Whereas I from early on decided to go with the IFR and it served us very well. So people, the two people on average listening to my video, you know more about this development than anybody else on this planet. <laughs> Nobody else I think has this, has this curve. Uh, okay, mapping progressions over, over seasonality. Uh, so remember I, I, the green is just a sort of fictional curve, how you would imagine it, you know, playing out and modeled a bit on Sweden, but only like roughly. Uh, you see the waves are getting smaller. So um, after September 22, the next wave will come up, but that will be a very low wave, I think. So I will, you know, I'll get there eventually, maybe next month or so, I'll start squeezing this image such that I can extend it by another six months so that we can see the next um, seasonal cycle. Um, but yeah, I mean, more or less, Sweden obviously more or less adheres to their own curve because the curve is modeled on Sweden, so therefore it's not by definition. Um, and then other countries, you know, to some degree, another are similar. Here's, uh, yeah, nor Northern Hemisphere countries, obviously. Germany, um, you see, they, uh, they kept it very low uh, at the very beginning and also last uh, winter with massive interventions. But it just means that they are now sort of quite high, right? Because they're just backfilling. They've just postponed those fatalities, right? Not actually eliminated them, but they've postponed them. And you could say, yeah, but isn't that a positive thing? That people live a year or two longer. Yeah, yeah, but at what cost to everybody else, right? There are 84 million people in Germany, all of them suffering because of this slight postponement of fatalities. So, yeah. Um, US, yeah, always a bit higher than everybody else, but, you know, broadly follows the same trend, now very low, uh, partially because of high penetration, relatively high penetration, slightly higher than in Europe penetration, so you would expect it to be now getting into a lower you know, uh, curve, sorry, I skipped one, UK, yeah, um, UK was the most jumpy because of their fickle policy, they went back and forth between Hammer and uh, Laissez-faire like three times. <laughs> so they had a lot of yo-yo-ing, uh, which is funny, except it's not funny for the healthcare system. So the one thing that politicians said, we must predict our healthcare system, the UK politicians didn't. <laughs> they did the opposite. They made it worse because they created the spike, unnatural spikiness through their measures. But of course, as I said many times, you know, since last summer with Freedom Day, they have actually had a rational uh, policy, more rational than most European governments, and it served them. It served them well. So now they are more or less where you would expect them to be. So that's good. Um, Divergence, yeah, so all the back to normal countries are really now back to normal. I mean, they may not know that, they not, may not act upon it, but they basically wouldn't need to do anything now. I mean, they have a full 99% herd immunity. Uh, <clears throat> uh, they could just let go and do nothing, but they, for many of them are still having some measures because they just don't understand that they, <laughs> there they are, right? Uh, because only we have this figure. Um, Sweden is very interesting, right? So I've always been lauding Sweden for their policy, but interestingly, they are further away from getting none than almost anybody else. Why is that so? One, of course, the vaccination rate has stalled. So Swedes just say, you know, they, and again, the government not enforcing the vaccination rate too much, which is a good thing, means it's not among the highest. And the Swedes are fairly relaxed about the vaccination. So that's actually a good thing, but it means that the number, because I'm using this as a metric, remember, it always matters what you choose, you know, and you, then you interpret it, you have to remember what it means, right? Uh, a country having a low vaccination rate in some countries just means that they're more liberal and they leave people a genuine choice not to get vaccinated, which is good. <laughs> <laughs> so in that sense, this low rate, for example, in the US, 66.6%, that's good. It means the Americans still have some degree of individual freedom, right? Because it's very rational. I mean, the rational number would be 30%. 
or less, right? The, peop the people who actually have some, some measurable risk, or maybe only 30% or less, right? So that would be, so the lower the better in some ways, provided, provided you have focused your vaccine on those who really need it. Now, no country has done that. They have all splattered. So therefore, the number has to be higher. So in order to get those, at those 30% in the US who are really at risk, they have to have 60 or 70% just because they are cluttering it. Um, machine gun fire, you know, not targeted. If they had targeted, they, their number could, you know, the right number would have been much lower, 25, 30%. Anyway, so in Sweden, they have uh, not, they have, rolled out like everywhere else indiscriminately here you know vaccine but i don't think they have they are enforcing too much of it so the ratio is a bit lower than in some other european countries but you know it's up there 75 percent it's nothing unusual and the penetration rate is low because i think my interpretation is they really allow people early on to expose themselves to the virus so some people died very quickly and it was not pity when those people in those old folks home all of a sudden started dying away. But people in Sweden got exposed to this virus earlier than just about anywhere else on this planet on average. Right? And one reason their, their infection rate show is still so low, even though it, everything is open. So it's not as if people are locking themselves up or anything like that or wearing masks or so. No, it's just that they have a high degree of natural immunization early on. And remember, this is time bound. Every year, or every month, or every day that passes, the IFR actually tends to trend up, right? Because we're getting older, not younger, remember? So having exposed their population to the virus early on, more freely than in other countries, not having had the lockdowns, means on average, Swedes have a higher natural um, uh, protection, right? In other words, because I use the same formula for everyone in terms of how I apply the IFR, and I calculate this infection ratio on the basis of the IFR, it doesn't take into account that actually the Swedes did the right thing. And therefore their natural immunization levels are actually higher than in many other places. So this IR, so this is a circular, argument that is basically wrong. <laughs> it's just a formula, right? In the case of Sweden, which did the right strategy, their penetration is probably much higher than 46%, but their fatality ratio is low. The IFR is lower than in comparable countries. Why? Because they expose people earlier to the virus. They did the right thing. Right. So it, uh, almost in, in the graphic, it almost looks like I'm punishing them for doing the right thing. Oh, you're so far away from, you know, the, the formula tells me you're so far away from being done with this because your infection ratio is so low, but that's an illusion. The infection ratio is probably much higher. It's not an illusion, it's just, comes, it's just the way the formula works, right? But in their case, I should actually lower the IFR to give them credit for having exposed their people early on and having allowed them therefore to really get to know the virus in different variants. Um, so, I mean, that's my hypothesis, right? That that's the explanation. Why isn't the IR higher? Meaning why isn't the fatality higher in Sweden? You would expect a higher fatality in Sweden, given their, you know, given, given their, just their, their population profile. Oh, but it isn't. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, we'll see what happens in the next autumn, right? If a new variant comes along, you know, there's still a lot of catch up to do. So I'm not going to fiddle with my formula here. But I think that may be the explanation why Sweden, having had the most normal or the most correct policy, is so far away from getting done, even though they've kept everything open for the most part, anyways. Well, we, precisely because they kept it open. Um, their fatality rates are too low <laughs> relative to all the other countries who did lockdowns and so on. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Germany and France are getting there. Um, the vaccination ratios are now growing very slowly, but they, at least 
up to now, they still had some fatalities every month, but of course now we are really entering the summer and that will get slower and slower. So Germany, so Germany is not likely to be done before the winter comes and then we'll see what happens in the winter. And then we have the so-called new normal countries here. And they, uh, they are far away. Um, even though they have high vaccination rates, they're far away from being done because their natural infection is so low because of all these measures. You know, they all wear masks. And so they do everything to keep the virus away from them, which as I've said many times over is the wrong, for most people, unless you're vulnerable, for most people, that's the wrong strategy. <clears throat> and, but they continue to do that. Thailand is a bit sort of in between. They, you know, they've loosened up quite a bit now. And, you know, I think they are sort of on their way to sort of getting out of this eventually. Whereas Japan and South Korea, they will not get out of this for probably several years at the current, you know, current rate. Yeah. <clears throat> And their, their case is different than Sweden. So the, that the formula doesn't show. Yeah, in Sweden, this formula may just not capture that they have very good immunity. In South Korea and Japan, it captures precisely that they have very poor <laughs> immunity. Uh, so it's very different. The numbers seem similar in terms of months, but it's a very different logic. Okay. Um, yeah. Nothing earth shattering change here. Yeah, here I just updated the numbers. And I mean, the, the number of people saved by government policy are rapidly dropping. We get rapidly getting to the point where it turns out we really haven't saved many people uh, through, even through those massive vaccinations because the by and large the vaccinations didn't reach the right people or they, they came to, to, some, to some people they came too late or even where they are effective, they are not effective for that long. So they may just delay fatalities. I mean, if the person is very fragile and the immune system is screwed up, no matter how many boosters you give them, maybe, you know, not all of them can be safe because they're just, they're just ready to die. <laughs> That's just the reality of life, right? Uh, so in the statistics, they may still pop up just a year or two later. So this number is rapidly dropping. So the, the and, and if their life expectancy on every six years, which is very generous, it's prob probably less than that, but you know, then if a million people have been uh, saved then you have only saved with your vaccines and everything and your lockdowns, you have saved 6 million life year, uh, men years, but the ones killed by excessive policies and by wrong allocations of the vaccine and so on, um, is by now it's already almost 6 million people and their lifespan I've now put 25 years, which is very conservative and maybe more. If you take those 6 million people that you've killed times 25 years average lifespan, you get 150 million man years that you've destroyed, you the governments with your policies. And that's a, by now it's a factor of 24. <laughs> 24 times as many men years destroyed as saved. I mean, this is, this is worse than I had even anticipated, right? I always said, well, it's gonna be an order of magnitude at least, so that's a factor of 10. By now we had a factor of 24. And it's not getting any prettier, I don't think, unless, unless I lower my excess mortality figures further, <clears throat> remember? My own figures were still a little bit lower than what I have now. Right? <clears throat> if I went back to my figures and ignored the Economist and the Lancet, yeah, then this factor would be maybe somewhat below twenty. But it's 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 a tr it's it's tremendous. You don't get around the fact, I think, no matter how you calculate, how you think about, it, that the government has killed far more life than it has saved with their measures. Apart from the fact that they have destroyed our liberties and our rights and our constitutions and our economies, right? <laughs> not even counting those things, right? just sheer man years destroyed, killed prematurely. Right? In fact, the ones saved, you could argue they are not premature at all. I mean, they're just dying naturally of an infectious disease as they should. 
So actually, those are the only ones who are, you know, natural now. <laughs> those people who actually die now of this, uh, in conjunction with this, uh, with this uh, pneumonia, they die a natural death. Yeah. Preventing them, so basically these saved are being prevented from dying a natural death. I'm not even sure that's a good thing, but okay, I grant you that statistically those many years, yeah, are saved, at least for now. But if you get into those types of statistics of counting men years, then you have to also count the ones that you're destroying and lo and behold, they are way higher. So there, whichever way you turn these policies of the last two years and a few months, whichever way you look at them, they were negative. There's nothing positive about them from any angle. And here's the vaccination uh, mania. So we have now vaccinated 4.4 times as many people as we should have. Uh, my prediction was we'll probably go to all out and have all 8 billion people vaccinated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so by now we have like 60% or so vaccinated. Wow, this, is, this figure excludes China and this figure includes China. So it's a bit... Um, discontinuous here, but it doesn't matter. I think the, the point I would like to make, though, is we've, we've now had almost 12 billion shots giving, given to people indiscriminately, meaning everybody, no matter what their profile, right? um, almost all of those. A few governments, to some degree, try to focus a bit on the elderly and some, but on the whole, they've just given it you know, to all and sundry in, in an indiscriminate way. Right? So most of them are wasted. right? What we should have is those 2 billion initial shots. So assuming double shot is needed to get a good effect, right? Just not, it's not true for all vaccines, but for most of them, double shot was sort of recommended. Okay, I take that. It may not even be true, but that it's needed, right? Remember, I once argued that actually the first shot probably already largely does the job anyways, but okay. I don't wanna argue with that. So I always said, okay, two shots I can accept. That the, that the experts say double shot is, is gives you really good protection, at least for some time. Okay. And that was needed for those who needed protection. Well, that I accept, right? And I would even go so far to say, well, those people who really are in that group, those 1 billion people who have some measurable degree of risk, it would be logical then to say they probably ought to get an annual booster, as we do with influenza, for example, where those people who are at risk, elderly in Europe, for example, are recommended, they're not forced, no, none of this should be forced, but recommended to get an annual influenza booster. Why? Because influenza changes all the time, right? The, the viruses change uh, all the time, and mutate, right? And, the and, and your immune system being already old cannot cope with all these new variants so well. That's why you get the booster shot. It gives you a good level of protection against the latest whatever we found, right? The same logic could apply here that once you've gotten yourself into that group and you say, I'm among those group, that group that is really highly at risk, it is only logical then to say, well, the initial two boost, the initial two vaccinations were good because it gave me a good level of a high level of protection early on, but I know their effect may, you know, slide down, um, both because our immune system partially forgets what they did you know, partially forgets the, the instruction, so to speak, and because new variants come about and they're a bit different, right? So therefore, uh, you know, maybe a seasonal booster once a year at the beginning of the winter season or the autumn season rather, is a logical thing. It's a similar logic as for influenza, right? That I can accept. So I would actually say you can continue using vaccinations, but use them as annual boosters for those people in this group who want it, right? That to me makes sense, right? And over many, many years until they're all dead. Now the younger ones are coming after them, they don't need that because we all get natural immunization. We don't need that. It's just the ones who really needed it from the beginning because they're already nearly 80 or 75 or you know, 65 if you want for men, whatever the, you know, the age group type, or they are even younger, but they are severely overweight or they have uh, other, other you know, uh, risk factors. Fine, fine, fine. You know, if you, once you define who they are, and I, back of the envelope target is about 1 billion people. So I was very generous in my definition, very pro. You know, um, you know those people, it's logical that after having gotten the double shot, 
a year or so later that they get a booster, and then a year later, another booster, until they die. I think there is a logic to that. Because they've gotten themselves on a track where they will never fully learn to protect themselves through the immune system. Because from the beginning, they, if you like, rely on the vaccine. And then you have to stay with it to have optimal protection. But all others who are not in this group should just stop getting any vaccination and should just trust in, your, in, in their immune system. They would be better off. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I respect that there's a gray zone and you know it's individual and subjective whether you decide I wanna be in that group or I wanna be in that group, right? But there can only be an individual choice. It cannot be something that a government decides for you, right? And that's a matter of how risk averse you are or not, how much you trust into your immune system or not, right? It's an individual choice, right? Uh, of course, anybody who feels like I want to get an annual booster, please do, right? It's your personal choice. It should be free or very cheap. I'm not suggesting to make this difficult for anybody, right? Anybody who wants the booster, please do. But be informed that it, unless you're in a risk group, it may be a bad idea to get the booster because you make yourself dependent on continuing to get the booster as you get older, right? Because you are not fully training your immune system if you get the booster. I mean, that, that is very simple, right? That just has to be told to people and then they can make their own choice. But I, I don't see any of that happening. There's none of that conversation outside my little video happening. Um, so for a long time to come, the wrong people will get vaccinated. Just lo and behold, it's when this, the autumn comes and case numbers go up again, despite what Yeong Kong, uh, Ong Yi Kong said about let's not be focused on case numbers anymore, which as I said, is self-serving, but is correct. <laughs> the European government will again focus on case numbers and they will again panic and they will again roll out campaigns uh, next autumn. I can already see it you know, on the horizon. And they will again waste vaccines on people who don't need them and in, in doing so prevent those people from actually learning to live with this virus naturally. It's and it's just not going to go away because nobody talks about it in the correct way. Nobody wants to really understand and admit how this actually works. So we will be stuck with this in this in this vicious cycle of misunderstanding and then misbehaving and then misunderstanding again and misbehaving more for years and years to come, not only in China, but you know, just about everywhere. Maybe not in some African countries where the people Locus said, we can't afford this vaccine. Good for them, right? They didn't need them anyways, right? They have a very small proportion of populations that are elderly. So, you know, yeah, I mean, it's almost, you're better off if you're a poor country, right? <laughs> oh, we can't afford this. Good for you. <laughs> I mean, one of the key factors why we're having this mess is because we have too much money to spend, obviously. You know, we don't mind wasting it on things that we don't need. Yeah. Yeah, long-term scenarios. Well, one, one interesting thing on 1st of May, um, there is a website called Ward Apes Yard Club, or the name. They sold, there's no joke, they sold 320 million US dollars in one day or something worth of virtual land in other side, which is the virtual land. <laughs> at something like 12,000 US dollar per plot. So you can buy virtual land in the metaverse and per plot, I don't know what the plot size is, a virtual plot size, whether it's me measured in square meters or cubic meters or in, not in meters at all, I don't know. They, are, they have plots and it costs you 12,000 US dollar per plot half of which actually was just apparently what they call gas. So in the virtual world, gas means it's the cost of minting or mining that plot. That piece of virtual reality needs to be minted, just like Bitcoins you know, have to be minted or mined. Uh, and that minting or mining costs money, right? Because it needs computing power. Right? Lots of it. And the computers need energy, et cetera. And energy prices are up, da, 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 right? So the gas that fuels just the creation of the plot was like more than half of that. 
US dollar, 12,000. And the rest is then sort of premium, right? <laughs> premium uh, price. Yeah, but, but it's, it's fascinating. So you can see how people are starting to literally move funds, real money, into the metaverse, buying properties in the metaverse. I mean, we've already seen that with, uh, with these tokens, the non-fungible tokens, NFTs, uh, that are trading now at prices that are already exceeding, to some degree, real objects of arts, for example, even the most famous objects of arts, right? So you now have uh, those tokens that, you know, go for tens of millions of dollars. Right? So people are massively investing in the metaverse. Yes, the Bitcoins of the world are down right now, and a couple of them have been, the, the cryptocurrencies have even gone out of business or almost uh, and crashed and so on. And that's to be expected. It's a very risky asset form. And you know, it, it's, it's expected that in this early day, it's going up and down and up and down. But I, from all I can see as a layperson, it's here to stay and it's gonna, over time, it's gonna uh, transform the way we, we think about payments and you know and what we and first of all we are changing what we are buying. I mean we are now buying virtual land, real money. And we are buying virtual tokens, artworks, for example, or things with real money, right? Because even cryptocurrency is real money in that it's grounded in a real computing process that is in a real uh, you know, a computer uh, factory where you know hundreds of computers are running and running and running using real fuel, <laughs> real oil and gas or solar <laughs> electricity, anyways. You know, to run and run and run, and they are maintained and operated by real humans who need a salary. So this is a this is a real economy on the basis of which a virtual economy is being created. That that is just about to explode, I think. I'm not an investor in this. I, you know, I'm, I'm conservative in my investment choices. I'm afraid to say, I'm not a good investment advisor by any means. Uh, but one thing to me seems to be clear that in the next decade or two, a huge portion of our total global wealth will migrate into the metaverse or onto the internet or into the digital world, whichever name you want to apply to it. And it's not yet just youth. The youth are the ones who are spending a lot of their time there, but the people who actually spend a lot of money there are people who have money, right? So the youth usually don't, right? Or they have very modest uh, amounts, right? Of course, if they're an Instagram personality or influencer, they, you know, they may be young and rich, but they're not that many uh, young and rich, right? So the, most of this money presumably is institutional money. So they are, you know, backed by people like you and I, probably a lot of millennials who, you know, are mid-aged now and, uh, you know, earn a salary and they take some of that and invest it in new forms of investment. Um, so it's not just youth uh, who are moving into the metaverse, you know, but the youth are the ones, I would argue, most likely to make it the center of their life. They literally spend seven, eight hours per day on a screen, right? At the moment, it's still your good old like a, a smartphone screen or maybe a laptop uh, screen. That may change over time. Uh, the the, the, the uh, interfaces may change, right? But they're spending seven, eight hours basically interacting with digital content or digital uh, uh, services or, or just with each other on a digital platform, right? So it's the youth primarily who are spending more and more time in the metaverse, but the money is not primarily maybe coming from uh, youth. So the economic aspects of it, it's probably much broader than that. So ultimately it's, you know, probably really nearly all of us <laughs> who more and more will spend part of our life <clears throat> on the metaverse. So that trend, I think, is more and more I'm convinced that that is a mega trend, right? And so that's not even a scenario. <laughs> that's almost like a given. Yeah. But 
We also have one leg in the real world and that doesn't go away. And so that leg in the real world that can be either a walking dead kind of leg or it can be a new romanticism kind of uh, uh, leg like maybe Russia at the moment, right? That, uh, Romanticism in the sense of, for example, a neo-nationalism, which is a kind of a romanticism, right? Um, <clears throat> or even the climate warriors, they're kind of in between, right? Because, I mean, this whole green movement and climate change movement and, uh, you know, uh, global warming uh, movement is, they are basically new romanticists to some degree. And they're also to some degrees walking dead because they, they're willing to self-abandon, give up, things that are precious to them on the back of this idea, which is a romantic idea of, oh, we need to protect nature, not trusting that nature can protect itself. Right? It's very similar, it's the same type of thinking, and that's why I think I originally had this, right? as the majority of us who apparently do not trust the immune system, right? which is just nature, their own physical nature, they don't trust their own body. Right? They trust more in like some medicine or some vaccine or some government policy, no matter what it is. They trust more in that than in their own ability to defend themselves, their natural ability in the immune system. Right? And these climate warriors are of very similar mentality. They don't trust that nature can protect themselves. They have this belief like the, the um, the people I mentioned earlier who spend money on protecting all of us, right? the Bill Gateses of the world, right? I don't know whether he's a climate warrior, but he's the type, right? That same type also thinks we now need to protect nature because nature cannot take care of itself. It's this parochial uh, attitude that only they are so smart to know better for everybody else, including even for nature. Nature cannot protect itself, it needs to be protected which I think is fundamentally wrong. It, it's humanity and our individual capacity that needs to be defended. Nature can fend for itself. <laughs> we are always also part of nature. We never, even if we live in the metaverse, that server farm or there's thousands and thousands of server farms needed to power the metaverse, they're still sitting in nature. They are subject to thunderstorms hitting them, <laughs> asteroids you know, <laughs> breaking down on them, or rising temperatures making it ever harder to run them without overheating. Well, whatever it is, right? They are still in nature, right? Even the metaverse is encapsulated within nature. The basic laws of physics are not going away, even if you go into the metaverse, right? Basic laws of physics, that's nature. So th this idea that we are like God, right? Like a transcendent God, like the God of the Christians or the Jews or the, or the Muslims, transcendent God who looks at the world from the outside and then like a pu puppet player, uh, you know, has to pull the strings because the world here cannot sort of exist on its own, right? That idea is, is it's just the same idea that now it's like these, these, these climate warriors is like, oh, nature is like, it's overheating, it cannot uh, regulate itself. So us, we are these transcendent gods who from the outside manipulate, oh, it's too warm, so we need to reduce our CO2 outcome, right? output, right? Uh, it, it's the same ideology, the same thinking of transcendence, which I think is fundamentally wrong. There's no such thing that this transcends uh, nature. That is my basic uh, credo, right? Uh, Spinoza basically is behind this, right? Um, Spinoza, 17th century philosopher who basically created that view, he's not the first perhaps, but the most prominent to say, no, everything is immanent. There's no transcendent God, right? Uh, Deus sive natura, he said, God or nature, it's the same thing. God is nature, right? God is... Uh, uh, co-expansive uh, or, uh, or if you like, uh, um, uh, uh, co-existent uh, with his creation. Whether you call that creation the universe or the cosmos or the world or you know, all things or the one, or 
there are many terms for that creation, but God and his creation are one thing. God doesn't stand outside of his creation, looking at it from the outside and then manipulating it like a puppet player. I don't think so. Um, now, if you want to have that belief that God is transcendent, okay, I cannot prevent you from doing that. But um, it, it is that kind of attitude anyways, that these people like climate warriors have. Oh, I know about, oh, I can see this is dangerous and we have to save nature, save the planet. <laughs> and in the process, the reason they are walking dead at least halfway, they're halfway between being a new romanticist and being a walking dead is because they're willing to give up themselves and all that's, that makes life livable for themselves maybe not all of it, but some of it anyway, so they're willing to give up for this bigger idea of, oh, I need to save the planet. As if the planet is somewhere outside of us, right? As if we are not part of this planet, and imminent to this planet, right? And all the forces, the, 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 the physical, and you know, biological forces that penetrate this planet, right? We are part of that, we are imminent, uh, immanent to it. We are not transcendent beings, um, but they act as if they were. Right? And that is why they are somewhere between new romanticism and walking dead, right? Yes, they still consider themselves as embodied, so they care about the environment because they live in it and they want it to be comfortable, da 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 da, da right? So they are not abandoning their, their body as, as those people do who go into the metaverse. Not fully, of course, but at least for eight hours per day, they're abandoning their body. Not all of it, they still need their eyes and their fingertips, but <laughs> they need less and less of their body. Um, but these people here on the left, they, they, they feel embodied. But they are torn between self-realizing and self-abandoning, right? Uh, they give themselves away to save a planet, but then again, they think that by saving the planning, the planet, they are self-realizing themselves. Right? So it's it's some kind of a cu curious figure eight <laughs> infinity, <laughs> an infinite loop. Uh, it's very interesting, but um, it's only partially rational, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Whereas the Russians who go to war, they are more on the northern end. They say, we are self realizing our nationalism, our historical uh, uh, claims by going to war. That's a very human, physical, and embodied kind of thing, right? So that is firmly here in what I call new romanticism. You know? I mean, to think of the greater good of the people or the nation as the greater thing, like, oh, the individual doesn't matter, it's the nation that matters. That's sort of a very romantic idea, right? Um, actually, not, not necessarily, right? I mean, we have to be very careful with these words, and I know I have to be careful because the romanticists, the real ones of the uh, late uh, 18th and early 19th century, they put a lot of store on the individual, actually, and not on the nation. Right. Or they had layers where they said, yeah, the nation and the world as a whole, it's, you know, nature, all of those are important spheres. But at the center of that sphere, they actually saw the individual. Right. So in that sense, these Russians who play this nationalistic game are not really romanticists. So it's a bit more complicated than I tried to put it here, but um, there you go. I don't... I don't mean to over invest in this. So the, the main thing that happened in the last months is this 320 million US dollars worth of real money flowing into virtual land <laughs> in other side. <laughs> Welcome to other side. And with that, uh, I see you in a month's time. Take care. Bye bye.